We're continuing to look at requirement three for battery management systems, which has to do with performance management. Two of the estimates that must be produced by the battery management system are the amounts of energy presently stored in the battery pack and the amount of power available over the near term future. We're going to start our analysis of these requirements by first considering how much energy is available in a single cell in a battery. Remember that energy is an ability to do work which we can measure either in watt hours or kilowatt hours. We can compute the total energy in a cell in a fairly simple way. The energy is equal to the total charge capacity of the cell Q multiplied by the area under the open circuit voltage relationship between the present state of charge and the minimum state of charge permitted by the application. This integral might look difficult to compute, but in fact it's possi possible to pre-compute its values and store them in a table for easy lookup using a table lookup interpolation scheme as the battery management system operates, which you will learn how to do in a later lecture this week. So the total energy available in a cell has something to do with the voltage relationship between a minimum state of charge and the present state of charge and a total capacity. And this is sometimes adequately approximated by taking the nominal capacity and multiplying by the nominal voltage and multiplying that by the difference of state of charge between the present operating point and the minimum permitted state of charge. The figure on the right shows some example open circuit voltage relationships for six different varieties of lithium ion battery cells that we've tested and calibrated in our laboratory. The lower two curves correspond to two different uh, varieties of lithium iron phosphate battery cells, and you can see that these have the characteristic of a very flat open circuit voltage relationship between about 10% and 90% state of charge. So the true open circuit voltage is actually very well approximated by the nominal cell voltage in that range, and this approximate relationship on this slide would very likely work quite well for iron phosphate type of cells. The other four curves are for different varieties of lithium ion cells that include lithium manganese oxide and uh, lithium cobalt oxide and nickel manganese cobalt oxide cells. These voltage relationships are not quite as flat and so the approximate energy computation would not be as adequate in this case or as accurate but still for some applications it might be sufficient depending on the nature of the application. Notice that the equation for energy is not a function of the magnitude of current used to withdraw that energy. and In other words, it's not a function of rate. To the first order, it's also not a function of temperature. We have already noticed that the total charge capacity of a battery cell is not a function of temperature. And while the open circuit voltage relationship has a slight temperature dependence, it's not enough to change the available energy significantly. Uh, this statement might contradict your intuitive feel for how much energy is present if you have experience working with lithium ion battery cells. You might already know that it's impossible to get as much energy out of a cold battery cell as it is to get out of a warm battery cell, even if both were to start with the same amount of charge in them. But we need to be careful with what we're defining to be the energy contained in a cell. If a cell has one unit of energy, it does not depend if the cell is warm or cold or how quickly we take the energy out of the cell. It has one unit of energy. If I warm up the cell, that doesn't appreciably change the energy, except maybe for some thermal vibration and some electrochemical bonds where that changes just a little bit. The amount of energy changes only slightly due to the differences in open circuit voltages in the cell. But if I try to extract this one unit of energy from a warm cell, I may be able to do so. And if I try to extract it from a cold cell, I may not be able to do so before encountering a lower voltage limit. And that's the key, encountering the lower voltage limit. This is because the cell resistance increases at cold temperatures. And when we're discharging, we encounter this voltage limit more quickly because of the ohmic voltage drop of the cell, which we'll learn in the second course of the specialization we compute as current times resistance. If I 
have a cold cell, maybe I can extract only 0.5 units of energy from that cell. But then if I warm up that cold cell, it turns out I can extract the remaining 0.5 units of energy. So the energy was still there, it just wasn't available at that point in time because of the high resistance of this cell. So this equation on the slide shows you how to compute how much energy is physically present, but it does not tell you how to extract all of that energy. And that's why we need power estimates in addition to energy estimates, because the power estimate tells you how quickly we can extract energy at this point in time. Okay, so power limits state the maximum rate at which we're able to move energy into the battery cell or out of the battery cell without exceeding electronics design limits or some battery electrochemical design limits. If I attempt to discharge or charge a cell at too high a power level, I will accelerate the rate of degradation, and that will lead to a premature battery pack failure. So we've just reviewed energy, which is a total quantity, quantity that describes a total amount of work that can be done. Power instead is an instantaneous quantity that refers to the rate at which we can do work. Power is equal to voltage multiplied by current, and it's measured either in watts or in kilowatts. When we compute power limits, there's an immediate challenge. We understand that power is an instantaneous quantity. Power is what's happening right now, but the host application probably doesn't care what's happening right now. Instead, it wants to do some planning. It needs to know how much power will be available in the near future, not just what's happening right now. So when we compute the available power estimates, we're not computing how much power is being used at this moment, which we could do very simply as current times voltage, and we measure both of those. Instead, we're informing the host application how much power it may use at some constant level for some future time horizon. And we call this time horizon delta t. So at this point in time, we compute a value of how much power is available, and we pass that value to the host application. And we're saying to the host application, you may use a certain level of power for the next delta t seconds without causing any violation in electronics or chemical design limits. This time horizon delta t is often on the order of 10 or 20 seconds. Uh, the sample period of a battery management system is often once per second or even faster. And this power estimate is something that we update every sample. So I don't tell the host controller, you may use this much power for the next 10 seconds and then wait 10 seconds before giving it another update and how much power is available. Instead, I say this is how much power is available for the next 10 seconds. And then maybe one second later, I update that quantity with, oh, and by the way, now this is how much power is available for the next 10 seconds. And that will be a somewhat different number. And so we end up with what's called a moving window power limit estimate. I'm computing from now to a future 10 second value. And then one second later, I compute from that point to a future 10 second value. And I keep on doing that. And this allows the host application to adjust a little bit more smoothly to changes in the available power as the host application draws power or instead sources power that uh, will end up recharging the battery pack. There are some good methods and some poor methods for computing power. In this lesson, I will share with you one simple method to compute available power that's actually quite commonly used, but it does have some limitations. And so in the fifth course of the specialization, you will learn some better methods. The figure to the left illustrates this simple method, which is sufficient for you to understand right now. Um, this method is known as the hybrid pulse power characterization, or HPPC method. It's based on performing a very simple test on a battery cell in the laboratory and measuring some quantities from that test that we later use to calculate power. The figure shows a profile of cell voltage versus time. The cell is initially allowed to rest until it has reached equilibrium. And in this slide, that equilibrium voltage is shown to be 3.8 volts. The cell is then subjected to a discharge pulse that has exactly the same length as the time horizon delta t required for the power calculation. Then we allow the cell to rest again until it reaches equilibrium, or at least close to equilibrium, which I have abbreviated in this slide 
to also be only 10 seconds. The cell is then subjected to a charge pulse for the exact duration required when computing charge power. Finally, the cell is permitted to rest. Because we have designed this test and because we have implemented this test, we know the exact charging current and discharging currents used to create these pulses. And we also measure uh, from the voltage profile, uh, we can measure the maximum amount of voltage change due to the discharge pulse and the maximum amount of voltage change due to the charge pulse. The maximum voltage change to a discharge pulse is measured from the beginning of the discharge pulse just before the discharge pulse is applied when the cell is still in equilibrium to the end of the discharge pulse when the voltage is at its minimum. That is our, um, our delta V discharge. We do the same thing for the charge pulse. We measure the change in voltage due to the charge pulse from the equilibrium point just before we apply the pulse of current to the maximum voltage at the very end of the pulse of current, and that is our delta V charge. From these voltage changes, we can compute a charging effective resistance and a discharging effective resistance over the time horizons delta T that are required by the power calculations. The effective charging resistance is the absolute change in charging voltage divided by the charging current, and the effective discharge resistance is equal to the absolute change in the discharging voltage divided by the uh, discharging current. These resistances are tabulated as functions of initial state of charge and temperature. Notice that if you are familiar with battery models already, please notice that the resistance we're calculating here is not the instantaneous or ohmic resistance of this cell. Instead, it's an effective resistance over the entire interval of delta T seconds, and it includes both the ohmic effects and also the diffusion effects as the voltage changes due to the slow time constants of the electrochemical processes in the cell. Once we have performed the laboratory tests and have calculated resistances at different states of charge set points and different temperatures and have stored these values in a table, we can use them in real time to compute available power estimates. In particular, we will use a mathematical model of how a battery cell works in order to predict how much power is available. We look at, in detail at creating circuit models of battery cells in the second course in the specialization, but here we need only a very simplified model so I can introduce that quite quickly. The HPPC method assumes these, this uh, circuit model that is drawn in the figure. In the model, the cell terminal voltage is described as an open circuit voltage at the present state of charge, uh, along with a voltage drop across the effective resistance of the cell. In other words, the terminal voltage is equal to the open circuit voltage minus current times resistance. We can perform some simple algebra to find uh, the electrical current in this equation, and this results in uh, the relationship that current is equal to open circuit voltage minus terminal voltage, all divided by resistance. When we use the HPPC method to compute the amount of discharge power that's available, we assume that we're concerned only with keeping the cell terminal voltage between some Vmin and Vmax limits. And so for the maximum discharge power, this would be achieved if the terminal voltage were always equal to Vmin. So to compute discharge power, we replace R in the current equation with the discharge resistance we tabulated from our test and we replace the terminal voltage with the value V min. Then discharge power is equal to voltage multiplied by current, which is equal to V min multiplying the quantity of open circuit voltage minus V min all divided by the effective resistance of this cell. To compute the amount of charge power available, we repeat the entire procedure, but we use a different assumed terminal voltage and resistance. That is, we use the same simplified cell model, where current equals open circuit voltage minus terminal voltage, all divided by resistance. Uh, but to compute the charge power, we replace the resistance with the tabulated charge resistance, and we set the terminal voltage equal to the maximum permitted voltage. 
We compute charge power then as voltage multiplied by current or as the maximum voltage multiplying the quantity of open circuit voltage minus the maximum voltage all divided by the effective charge resistance. Notice that this quantity is negative. That is, open circuit voltage must always be less than the maximum voltage. So if we are required to report charge power as a positive number, we simply take the absolute value of this equation by multiplying this result by negative 1. Also note that this method, the HPPC method in general, uses a very simplified cell model that does not include all of the effects occurring inside of this cell. And furthermore, that when we computed the effective resistance from our cell test, we assumed that the cell was initially at rest before we begin the experiment. So these equations are not perfectly accurate in a dynamics uh, scenario for the real battery cell. And it's a common practice to derate the estimates produced by these equations by multiplying the computed power value by some factor slightly less than 1. For example, if we compute an available discharge power of 1 kilowatt, we might multiply that by some factor like 0 0.9 and report that 900 watts is available instead. This gives us some safety margin, but it actually artificially limits the performance of the battery pack because we have used a poor estimation method. If we were to use a better estimation method, we might be able to actually extract the full performance of the battery pack, and that's uh, one reason to spend more time thinking about this in the fifth course of the specialization. So to summarize this lesson, you've learned how to compute cell total energy and cell available power. Cell total energy is easily computed if we already know the cell state of charge, the total capacity, and the open circuit voltage relationship of this cell. Cell available power is estimated over a moving time horizon at this future window that allows the host application to know how much power is available in this near future time frame so that it can do some planning of how to use that power and then use the battery cell without causing damage to the cell or to the electronics connected to this cell. You've also learned about the HPPC method, which is a simple way to characterize this cell and to estimate power. But you've also learned that the HPPC method has some limitations, as we will examine in much more detail in the fifth course of this specialization. So the HPPC computations, if you choose to use them, should be derated in practice in order to ensure safe and robust operation of a battery pack. This concludes this lesson on computing energy and power for a single cell. In the next lesson, you will learn how to compute the energy and power for a multi-cell battery pack instead.